Texas Longleaf Team is an interagency multidisciplinary consortium formed in 2014 to promote and support the restoration of the longleaf ecosystems in East Texas. Jenny brings unique skills and experience to the Longleaf Team, starting with her uh, MS program, which explored motivations for longleaf, uh, sorry, landowner participation in conservation programs, and later as the conservation program coordinator for the Texas Wildlife Association. In that position, Jenny worked to build and nurture partnerships with state and federal agencies, other nonprofit and private interests in large scale conservation efforts, including the Leon River Restoration Project, Trinity River Initiative, Edwards Aquifer Recovery Implementation Program, and more. Okay, I hope there's somebody just sent a message saying there's no sound. I hope that's just one person and not just not everybody. Um, so, more recently, Jenny worked in the communications realm, promoting constituent and landowner engagement in advocacy initiatives and implementation of conservation easements. So, thank you, Jenny, for coming to talk to us today, and let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for, for joining us on your lunch hour um, and listening um, to what we've got going on over here in behind the Pine Curtain in East Texas. Um, as Paul said, I'm the coordinator of the Texas Longleaf team um, and have been here for about a year. No, that's not right. I've been here through COVID, um, but about a year uh, working um, actual work. As you all know, we were in such such strange times there for a while, um, but finally getting on the ground and we're, we're experiencing a lot of good stuff uh, with our team. And so I'm excited to share it with you. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, variety of, of familiarity with the Longleaf team, uh, the Longleaf ecosystem uh, on this call, but I'm gonna, I'm still gonna kind of go back to the basics because I'm, I'm sure there's folks um, that may not have as deep of an understanding of the values of the Longleaf ecosystem. So we'll go into that and talk about some of the history of, of how we got to where we are. Um, I'm going to talk about the Texas Longleaf team itself uh, as kind of the western edge of this range-wide effort throughout the southeast to um, to restore this ecosystem. And then I'm going to kind of lay out kind of a framework that we've been using to to make this the, the idea of the business case for longleaf restoration. Um, I think in the conservation community, we've all gotten really, really good about the warm and fuzzy of uh, talking about the 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 butterflies and the birds and the the conservation and the legacy and all these um, great values that that um, ecosystem restoration brings, um, but uh, we've we've really made it a priority with our team to work towards, in addition to those values, um, working really hard to articulate the, the the business and the economic side of why ecosystem restoration could benefit both landowners as well as corporate interests, um, particularly as we look to the future and the growing focus on ESG um, and the realization that conservation and restoration efforts have a real opportunity to raise corporate support. And that's something that we're, we're focused on and I'll, I'll kind of lead you through what we're working on there. And then obviously some of the challenges we're looking and opportunities that we're looking to the future um, to see. So, uh, at the time of settlement, over 90 million acres of longleaf pine dominated the southeast from Virginia to Texas. Uh, in Texas, there was approximately 3 million acres of longleaf within a matrix of about 12 million total acres of piney woods. Um, early southeast Texans found sustenance in these forests in the form of plentiful game, such as the obvious deer, turkey, raccoon, squirrels. Um, but Later and later built their local economies from these valuable forest products, um, timber, but also naval stores, tar, pitch, turpentine that are derived from the resin of pines. Um, and that abundance of both game and economic opportunity were, were really unrivaled in the prevalence of the longleaf pine forest in that area. So around the turn of the century, the 20th century, these forests were characterized by, you know, large old growth trees set in this prairie like um, understory of native and diverse plants that you see here. Many, you know, uh, people grazed cattle under the lo under longleaf pine forest, something you, you very rarely see today in Texas. Um, healthy longleaf habitats are characterized by three, basically three key features. 
large mature trees, natural regeneration. Uh, you can see in the center picture some of those young seedlings coming up. Um, and, and then this understory that's dominated by a diversity of forbs and grasses with really very few mid-story shrubs or woody plants. And this prairie-like understory is the product of a much more open canopy um, growth form uh, in longleaf than other southern pine species that allows that sunlight to reach the forest floor. And then, of course, frequent wildfires back in the day and now prescribed fire, um, which control that woody growth and encourage the diversity of that herbaceous ground cover. So not surprisingly, such diverse and productive plant communities, and we're talking up to like 500 species per acre at some sites, produce abundant and diverse wildlife. And, you know, obviously the recreationally important species like white-tailed deer and eastern wild turkeys, bobwhite quail in some areas thrive in these habitats. Um, but then we also see a whole many species of conservation concern, as many of you probably know, um, depend on this open pine savanna habitat that's provided by mature longleaf forests. You know, pocket gopher, Louisiana pine snake, Bachman's sparrow, brown-headed nuthatch, red cockaded woodpecker, all, you know, kind of top the list of those high-priority wildlife native to longleaf forests. Um, in fact, when you look at it, mature longleaf pine forests are among the highest priority for bird conservation throughout the southeast, um, but particularly in southeast Texas. So why was long, longleaf so dominant in the southeast? Um, I love this map because it tells a really clear story. Um, the map on the right um, depicts cloud to ground lightning flash density for 2005 to 2012. We could have selected any date range. They all look relatively the same. But the southeastern coastal areas with the highest lightning strike density almost perfectly match the Longleaf historic range. And not only is longleaf fire resistant, but it actually depends on fire throughout its life cycle. So it's really no wonder this was the dominant species in these areas prior to that human suppression of fire that we've seen throughout the United States, really. So tonight, today, of course, we rely on the use of controlled or prescribed fire to mimic that historic process. And, and that's what creates the ideal environment for longleaf seed germination, that natural regeneration and that healthy forest understory. Ultimately, um, the ax and the sawmill reign supreme in the historic longleaf pine forests of Texas. Longleaf figured significantly in the industrial forestry of this period, um, and, and it's because it was a high, high quality fiber. Um, and, you know, you had some huge diameter old growth trees that were harvested. Um, and, and characteristically, longleaf is, is really straight. Uh, it's used a lot for poles now. Um, and so it was, a, it was a very attractive tree to harvest for lumber. Um, and with the innovation of the transportation and, and uh, rail networks uh, after the Civil War, um, we, we saw a drastic um, increase in stand harvest to meet the increasing demand for lumber and those naval stores, and we saw the reign of the mighty longleaf quickly fade. Very few timber companies, of course, replanted longleaf um, because the only commercially available seedlings at the time were loblolly. So we saw a really quick increase, decrease in loblo longleaf and, a, and an increase in, in loblolly pine. And so with that steadily increasing population, the economic drivers of the timber industry gave way to that the plantation style forestry that we see today, where most tracts were replanted to monocultures of loblolly pine, where fire is suppressed and, and native plant diversity is, is very limited. Um, and that led by the timber companies, many landowners accepted this new principle of fire suppression and adopted short rotation clear cutting strategies, um, just really devastating the longleaf's position on the landscape. Um, and as a result, diversity, plant diversity, and wildlife diversity drastically declined throughout the landscape. So by 2009, 2009 less than 3% of the historic range of longleaf remained. Um, in response to the realization of, of both the importance of longleaf and its decline throughout the historic range, America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative was born. 
uh, ALRI represents a, a coalition of, of federal and state agencies, nonprofit organizations, forest industry, private landowners, and you know other interests who have united in this single cause to restore longleaf throughout the southeastern United States. The initiative partners worked together um, to develop a, a range-wide conservation plan in 2009, which serves as, as a roadmap for collaboration across the historic range uh, and establishment of these local partnerships of which the Texas Longleaf team is, is the Western edge of, I think there's 18 uh, Longleaf implementation teams throughout the range, um, all modeled around this, this idea of collaboration and um, restoration. Uh, since 2010, the collective efforts of ALRI partners have resulted in more than 1.5 million acres of new longleaf stands and protection of over 200,000 acres and then management of millions more of, of longleaf forests. International paper, uh, going back to that, this, this idea of corporate support uh, was one of the early corporate pioneers supporting longleaf restoration. With the launch of the Forest Land Stewards Program, which is a, a partnership with NIFWIF in 2013. Uh, since that time, the Forest Land Stewards Program, with the help of these local implementation teams uh, throughout the range, has deployed millions of dollars, resulting in uh, right at 300,000 acres of, of longleaf restoration. So you might ask, why would a paper company invest in conservation? Um, well, the way IP sees it, you don't have sustainable a sustainable paper company without sustainable force. Um, and so they've, they're really a model for um, putting their money where their mouth is and in, in promoting um, restoration efforts. So Texas Longleaf team was formed in 2014, again, in the model and, and under the umbrella of America's Longleaf um, with the goal of um, accelerating restoration of Longleaf in, in Texas. Um, our goals identify that by 2025, we will establish 15,000 acres of, of new longleaf, um, enhance or maintain 110,000 acres, primarily through prescribed fire, some herbicide and mechanical, but primarily prescribed fire, and then conserve 30,000 acres of longleaf on private lands through easements um, to, to preserve them as working forests. Uh, accomplishing these goals would more than double the area of, of Texas longleaf uh, documented in the 1990s, and, and we're well on track to, to accomplish this. Um, in order to accelerate that restoration on private lands, we currently work to connect, our, our, our goal is to connect landowners with funding, but also education, technical assistance um, for planning and management practices that, that benefit, benefit the longleaf ecosystem. Map to the right is our priority zones. That's a, a, a pretty intensive mapping uh, priority prioritization exercise we did a couple years ago um, to make sure we were, we were putting our restoration efforts in the highest, um, highest priority areas um, and looking at connectivity, historic range, uh, partner priorities and that type of thing. So we, we work in all of those counties, but but highest priority is in those red zones. So clearly uh, restoration efforts are not a, if you build it, they will come proposition. Uh, and you on this call understand that better than anybody. Um, you know, while we know that the contemporary East Texas landowner has, has very different goals for land ownership than the landowner of say 20 or 30 years ago, a large majority list, with, with the example being that a large majority list recreational, wildlife, ecosystem, and legacy as top drivers for their land management decisions, with income and investment ranking much lower on their priority scale. Uh, but restoration still needs to make financial sense, and, and, it, and it really absolutely does, and this is the message that we try to get out to landowners. So Longleaf is more resistant to wildfire. Uh, we talked about the reason for that. It's also more resistant to drought, to pests, and wind events than other southern pine species. Again, this is the this is the tree that was meant to be in these in these areas, um, and therefore it's obviously more adapted uh, to survive there. Um, <clears throat> and that resiliency translates into asset protection, which is obviously attractive to any savvy forest owner or investor. 
Um, Longleaf is, as I said, known for producing great quality lumber with superior strength, dur durability, and appearance. Uh, if you've ever walked in a, an old house, um, 100, 100 year old house, and it had wood floors, they were likely longleaf. Um, for example, a uh, well managed longleaf stand can produce excellent quality uh, utility poles, as I mentioned earlier, starting at age 30 to 35. This is a market that, that a lot of our, our landowners are exploring. Uh, and poles tend to bring much higher prices than, than saw logs from other species. Um, a longleaf forest, and this is one of our most, um, most uh, one of the things that resonates a, a lot with landowners is that um, these are multi-use forests that, that keep on giving for generations. Um, once established, a, a longleaf, longleaf will regenerate naturally, creating a multi-age forest that can be selectively harvested over time to generate income, while simultaneously providing wildlife habitat and recreational opportunities. And again, in stark, stark contrast to the, the, the uh, plantation model where you, you plant it and then, um, and then uh, just walk away and, and it's really unusable in a lot of ways for a long time. So increasingly, our team has made both the business and the values case for Longleaf to the landowner community. Since 2014, uh, our team has partnered with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation through that Forest Land Stewards Program mentioned previously uh, to provide $1.2 million of cost share funds to landowners for Longleaf restoration and management. That's a third of the way to our 2025 goal for planting and just under a quarter of the way um, to our goal for maintenance activities uh, such as fire and herbicide. Um, and over the last two grant cycles, the demand for support has increasingly outpaced the availability of funds that our team has to offer, uh, leading us to this critical realization that if we're going to continue to meet our conservation goals, we need to diversify our funding. And so our solution, um, encourage corporate investment in the long length ecosystem. But how do you do that? Um, we made the business case to landowners, but can we make the case that Longleaf restoration can be a valuable part of a company's social responsibility efforts? Uh, can Longleaf restoration give corporations that social license to operate in East Texas? Our analysis, um, we think yes. And um, so I'll, I'll kind of share where we're headed with that. This is a, a new effort for us, but um, uh, in making that case, this is this is kind of where we are. So obviously, carbon is is big in ESG, um, and we know that working forests in general are excellent at sequestering and storing carbon. That research is out there. We know that young, fast growing trees sequester carbon quickly, and old growth forests store carbon for long periods of time, hopefully not to be released back into the atmosphere. Um, this graphic from USDA illustrates that even under the production timber model of plant, walk away, harvest, replant, that, that, that uh, plantation style forestry, a working forest creates a net positive when it comes to carbon storage and sequestration, especially when you consider below ground carbon storage and carbon relocation in the form of building products. One can only then surmise that longleaf forests which is characterized by that diverse, those diverse, the diversity of age classes of trees, that diverse herbaceous understory, and the selective harvest over time, as opposed as opposed to the clear cutting and replanting that is assumed in in this graph, could only lead to more efficient and sustainable sequestration and, and storage of carbon over time. Um, and and that below ground carbon in a longleaf forest is significant. Uh, root systems of native vegetation, as you all know, uh, that is managed with fire, not only promotes storage of below ground carbon, but they also promote soil health and more effectively filter water and promote infiltration. Um, you know, production forestry is much like any other agricultural crop when it comes to soil health. Fast growing trees don't invest as heavily in root development and the dense understory characteristic of a lo loblolly plantation 
isn't really conducive to native grasses and other soil stabilizing and, and water conserving nutrient cycles. So you've probably seen this, this dramatic this depiction uh, in the middle of um, that floats around from time to time. Um, while, while this particular picture doesn't depict a forested system, the, the comparison between native vegetation and a monoculture of non-native or woody vegetation is stark and relevant. Um, this, 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 these uh, native grasses that are characteristic on the, on the left of the longleaf forest that's frequently burned are just simply not present in a loblolly plantation that many times is overgrown like the one you see on the right with, with um, woody vegetation. Um, and Samuelson et al. also documented the significant presence of below ground carbon in the longleaf forest that's managed by fire in 2014. Um, and they said that by clear cutting a forest and not maintaining the natural ecosystem that's below ground with those nat that native vegetation, you're missing out on about half of the carbon stock you could be accumulating and gaining valuable offsets for. So I'll, I'm going to stop here to say this is all great. This is all kind of our, our hypothesis moving forward. And I think probably most folks on this call could agree that, that what I've laid out when, as it relates to carbon is probably the case. The, the plantation model is good when it comes to carbon sequestration and storage. We think long leaves better. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that points to that. However, it's not good enough. We're finding for the corporate world to say, we think it's better. Um, and so our, one of our next steps and, and something we're launching kind of as we speak is a, 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 a research project that will quantify some of these benefits. And so hopefully the next time I talk to some of y'all, we'll have some, some concrete numbers here. Um, but. It's looking very positive that, that this could be a really good way that we could um, uh, communicate to the corporate world the values of, of what we're doing. Um, so beyond carbon, let's, you know, look at a second major quantifiable and attractive benefit of the longleaf ecosystem, and that's obviously water. We know that healthy managed longleaf ecosystems provide natural filtration of precipitation and stormwater runoff, resulting in cleaner water reaching communities. This natural filtration, you know, lowers treatment costs, enables utilities to avoid building or upgrading expensive treatment infrastructure, and, you know, could lead to keeping water affordable for customers. So the map to the right illustrates the uh, overlap of EPA source water protection areas with the historic longleaf range. So looking at that, restoration of longleaf could be critical to promoting water quantity and quality for communities in East Texas. Again, our research project that we'll be launching very soon will quantify that um, to say, what are the actual per acre benefits of that improved water situation? So why would a corporation invest in longleaf? It's because we believe that an investment in longleaf has the greatest potential impact for the most um, on the widest range of values to the environment, society at large, rural economies, and local communities than, than any other investment in our area. Um, so an investment of Longleaf is, is truly an investment in the sustainability of East Texas. So now that we've established this, in addition to the research that we're doing to quantify these benefits so that we can communicate that to corporations that might be interested in funding us, we felt like it was also, obviously, um, those people aren't going to come to us in most cases. Uh, so we needed to identify who those, those corporations are. Um, so over the past year, we have collaborated with Texan by Nature to embark on this mapping effort to identify corporate interests in our priority areas uh, so we can begin outreach to them. Uh, in tw so in 2020, we um, <clears throat> collaborated with Texan by Nature and other partners um, on this extensive priority mapping effort that I, I described below. Um, again, it included uh, the historic range, longleaf soils data, anchor sites where we know of existing longleaf, and then partner priorities for, for open pine restoration and, and species of concern. Um, and so the map to the left is the one I showed you earlier. It's the result of that effort. We then, with the help of Texan by Nature, pulled in all of the corporate holdings within those areas. 
um, and assign priority values based on their location. Now, now, some of these are corporate land holdings that may be interested in long leaf restoration. Some of the timber investment management organizations, real estate investment trusts, um, but others are corporate interests that may have ESG metric goals that align with the benefits of long leaf that that we that I outlined. Um, so then we also identified pipelines and other energy rights of way that intersect our priority areas. Again, assigned those priority to them. Um, and then our next step and what we're working on now is developing an outreach strategy um, to those those companies and and um, to um, to appeal to their to their values and and get their investment in long leaf restoration. So kind of. A two track effort here, we've got to quantify the values, but as soon as we have those values quantified, we're going to work on this corporate outreach so that we can diversify our funding and and not rely just on on NIFWIF um, to. Um, to be our sole funding source, um, so we're excited about those efforts, but 1 exciting thing and I said, most of these companies aren't going to just show up to us, but 1 of them did. Um, I gave a very similar presentation to this at the Texan by Nature Conservation Summit in uh, November of last year. And after the presentation, <clears throat> this gentleman in the red shirt walked up to me and said, I'm the head sustainability guy at HEB and we want to support what y'all are doing. I love what you're doing. It's very interesting. HEB is dedicated to um, impacting communities where we work and where we might work. And so what can we do to help you? And so we've been we've been working with them uh, over the past several months and just a couple of weeks ago, you might recognize some of the folks in this picture on the left. Um, Richard came down and, and visited the 2 sites that HEB funded through our program. Um, so that was really exciting for us. It's great to have a partner like HEB that truly does care about the communities that they're working in. Um, the, one of the projects is a restoration project, the one on the left, uh, in, in partnership with RMS, which is a, a TMO that, um, that owns and, and operates quite a bit of land in East Texas and, and is very, very dedicated to longleaf restoration wherever it works. And, and they kind of organize this field day to, to get the word about, about what they're doing and, and get all of our partners on board. Um, the gentleman on the right is kind of your traditional family forest owner. Uh, who's just really excited to, and he's a recreational landowner, loves to hunt, loves to take his kids out on the, and grandkids out on the land, and, um, and is just really excited about planting longleaf. So we're excited to have HEB as our first corporate partner. We have another, um, we're in talks with another uh, energy company right now that's, that's looking at probably, um, very optimistic that they're going to fund probably all of our seedlings for this upcoming planting season. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a great effort. We've been really excited about it and, um, and, and it, we're seeing good, um, good interest. So it, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, the, 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 the final thought I will leave you with is that landowners and you all know this, but landowners make sacrifices every day to promote ecosystem health, support the society and, and support society that depends on clean air and water and healthy wildlife populations. You know, and, and their contributions are great and, and unrivaled, but in many cases, their budgets are small. Um, and so the ability to come in and, and work with those landowners and provide them the resources to make such a great impact on ecosystems and on, on these, uh, rural areas of Texas is really exciting. So I want to also thank, I'm sure there's a number of people that are on our team. Um, I'm not going to try to name people, but that are on this call. This, this team is a team and it doesn't, what the work that we do doesn't happen without the, those diverse stakeholders that really roll up their sleeves every day um, and bring projects to us. They're the front lines with landowners and um, <clears throat> we really appreciate the, the agency and nonprofit partners that work with the Longleaf team. And I will stop there and Paul, I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. There are a couple of questions. There aren't many though. So, uh, if you were saving your questions until the end, please, uh, please get them. In the chat or the Q and a, um, so the 1st question is, sorry, if I missed it, 
what is the mean age of long leaf pine stands? Are the stands managed to allow for snags? Um, I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, you know, I, I would say when it regarding snags, um, I don't know of anybody that's going in and just, you know, getting rid of them on purpose. Um, and I wish one of, that's probably something that one of our forestry folks could answer better than me. If there's anybody on the call that wants to, uh, to, to um, you know, drop an answer in the chat or Q and A, I can read that out later. Um, and Jenny, just so we understand most of these long leaf pine stands are they um are they production uh timberlands that just have a longer rotation or are they purely set aside for the ecological and wildlife uh, values that you talked about or some combination of both yeah i would say most of them are a combination um i see that a lot of, of the family forest owners um are much more focused on the recreational value and they see long leaf as something that's usable that's that's there for you know especially the you know the average family forest owner that's planting this year they're not anticipating that they are going to be the ones that get any income other than maybe that first thinning um off of off of their longleaf forest they see it as a as a insurance policy perhaps for their kids but what they what they really want is a a forest that's usable and sustainable and and that that they can enjoy um, that's what i hear about all the time um brian townsend is this our nrcs state forester and he said yes snags are uh, that disappeared after i saw it but he said yes about snags um <clears throat> I, I would say that the the timos that we work with um they're they're looking at income uh and so it, it's just something that um it, they're just going to a longer rotation, but they will harvest at some point. Uh, but the family forest owners we we find are, are much less likely to. I mean, they're going to harvest, but I would I anticipate that a lot of that harvest is going to be on a more sustainable basis and not going back to a clear cut. Got it. So I see Brian's uh, comment here. It says snags generally left as wildlife uh, benefit standards range from one to ten per acre. So they left it left at those densities. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, it's not something I've dealt with yet. Okay, so the questions are coming in. We've got a couple of people here asking, how can we get involved? How can we get Longleaf on our property? They own, it's, they live yeah. in Polk County. They're interested. So I just, they reach out yeah, to you, right, Jenny? Yeah. Shoot me an email, jump on our website. Um, uh, my phone number's there. Um, I'd love to talk to you and we'll connect you with some of our folks and Get a site visit if appropriate and we can move from there uh, i did not mention that we have two rounds of funding every year we just closed one uh, april 15th and september 15th uh, every year we have so um our next our next round will be september 15th and generally that's a little late to for a planting project unless you've already done some of the site prep but it's for sure good for maintenance activities but then that april rfp is where we get the, the majority of our planting projects. Very good. Good plug there. I like that. Um, there's a rather lengthy question here. Let me read it all out for you. Okay, Jenny, it's going to take, okay. a, take a second here. It says, are you planning to, or have you looked at below ground mycorrhizal communities? Ectomycorrhizal fungi have been shown to be important for forest establishment and resilience. I'm particularly curious if the long-term planting of loblolly pine has altered the ectomycorrhizal communities away from the species important for longleaf pine and how those how that may impact forest establishment in response to perturbation. That's a good one. So I have a range degree and most of those were, it was a long time ago that since I went to <laughs> one of those classes. No, but I know that I know what you're, what you're getting at. And the good news is, even though I, I know what you're talking about, the good news is I've got folks that, that we're working with that absolutely will be looking at, at those items. Um, we've got, we're working uh, to, as I said, this, this research project that we're in the very early stages of, of exploring, um, we're working with grassland researchers 
um, that have done below ground carbon work before looking at absolutely those so soil health um, metrics as um, very important aspects. You know, it's interesting, um, you know, learning that it, when you're just talking to foresters, a lot of times they haven't thought a whole lot about um, grassland communities and because it's just been so far and so um, foreign to what they do for so many years. So with this research, we're tr really trying to pull in expertise from both the forestry community and the grassland community and um, and get get to some of those answers. But I don't know who sent that question, but maybe we need to talk and get you on a research team. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, Liz Bowman. I think. Okay. Uh, could be how you, I'm not sure how you say uh, her name, but yeah, write that, Liz, write down that email address and phone number and give Jimmy yeah. a call. Okay, and we've got another question here. Can standing deadwood be managed for red cockaded woodpecker as well as timber? Do you, I'm, not sure. mm. I'm not sure I understand that entirely, Jenny. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I do either. Okay. Andy Brian to answer that one again. So I'll repeat it. Can standing <laughs> deadwood be managed for red cockaded woodpecker as well as timber? I wonder if the question is about whether, um, you know, whether red cockaded woodpeckers will use deadwood as well as live timber. Um, I think they need a live tree. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the next question. Are you promoting a strong understory development for the longleaf pine forest of the 10 to 15 foot range or under five foot height? All the above. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so as, as soon as we can get that fire in there that, you know, that's when we start developing that, that ground cover. Um, and so it's, it's, it's there the whole time. And, you know, I think there is some issue with uh, canopy closure and, you know, you, you lose a little bit of that diversity from the point of canopy closure until a first thin, but, um, but yes, the, the idea is that that, that ground cover um, native, native plant understory is, is in development from, you can, you can run a, a fire over longleaf after the first growing season. And so, so you're really promoting that ecosystem below the trees from day one. Fantastic. So uh, Brian uh, chimed in again. He said, "Our uh, recocated woodpecker cavity trees uh, cavity trees require live trees. However, standing dead provides feeding and other species habitat." See, this is the cool thing about our team. Okay, so uh, Liz, if they fill in where I don't know the answers. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a good system. Yeah. Um, thanks, Brian. So Liz responded and says she's a fungal ecologist working at the University of Texas, who's worked with ecto and mycorrhizal fungi in ponderosa pine forests, and now working grasslands. And she would love to assist. So fantastic! Looks like you're building the team as we speak. I know it's great. Okay. Um, when is the plant giveaway so we can incorporate it with our annual tree giveaway in Livingston in February? So we've never done a giveaway. Um, what we do is we just fund seedlings. So um, our our program, our general, uh, our 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 traditional model has been the land we we con we give the landowner a contract through Texas A&M Forest Service that we we play pay some base rates. They're based on a fifty percent cost share. The landowner or, or consulting forester, whoever we're dealing with, handles ordering the seedlings, you know, contracting to have them planted and all of that. And then they invoice us and we we reimburse for our part of it. Um, in the case of of some some of these programs, there's one with Arbor Day and then there's one with uh, this this other company we're working on. If they grant us 100 percent seedling cost, then we will pay the whole seedling cost, but we don't actually buy the seedlings. Um, we let the landowner do that, and then we just reimburse. Got it. Um, somebody asked, what are ESG metric goals? So environmental, social, and governance is what that uh, uh, ESG stands for. And it, it's it's the, the uh, framework by which almost or, many, many corporations now are basically grading their um, 
their CEOs and their efforts saying, here's our goals. A lot of those are based on UN climate change metrics. Um, if you look into these companies, you know, many of them go look at, um, at uh, an oil company or, uh, or HEB, you can find their, their sustainability place on their website will list their ESG metrics. It will list what are our, what is our company's core beliefs? And some of them it's, it's um, to be carbon neutral by 2025 or to be water neutral or to promote sustainability or poverty or, you know, whatever that may be. And so they are graded by their ability to prove that these are our corporate values and here's what we did to put our money where our mouth is. <clears throat> and, and so it's, it's really driving a lot of corporate investment in conservation and, and other social programs at this point. Uh, but I really think it's it's a big part of the future of conservation funding because of the focus on climate change. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, somebody says here, I recently finished the Longleaf Alliance's book and it talked about how the places or about how the places in which Longleaf has grown historically is varied. Uh, as are the plants and wildlife that live along them, among them, sorry, the butcher in this. Um, <laughs> how varied are the Texas ecosystems with longleaf? How varied are the Texas yeah. ecosystems? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, so, you know, longleaf requires sandy, well-drained soils. Um, we have pretty established, um, Tyson Hart with the, with NRCS has done, uh, along with Mike Oliver, who was the previous NRCS state forester, did some pretty extensive um, soil mapping to determine the, the to, to map out the, the longleaf, um, high priority longleaf soils. So between the historic range that we have a pretty good idea of, those existing areas of longleaf and then the, the soil mapping efforts, um, we can have a pretty good idea of where longleaf should go. But that's why our, our priority map looks the way it does. Um, every area is not going to be a longleaf area. Um, some of those areas further on the, on the northern end, they were, they were you know, probably shortleaf, not longleaf. Um, as it gets colder, longleaf doesn't do as well, and and uh, a shortleaf does better. Um, so there there is some specific areas, but a big chunk of of this this core area where where our red heat map is 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 good longleaf country. Great. How small an acre site are you working with? So for our program, we require at least fifty acres. Uh, I would say most of our program, most of our projects fall between about 75 and 200. We have a few bigger than that, a few, you know, closer to that 50, 50 acre mark. But we, we do require at least 50 acres. Another one here. What other species of trees are you planting for diversity or are you focused strictly on longleaf? Yeah, we focus stri strictly on longleaf. Um, you know, a lot of times, a landowner, if they if they have a clear cut that they're wanting to replace longleaf, they'll leave some some mature hardwoods in there uh, for structure and diversity. Um, but but we we just plant longleaf. Okay, another one here. How does sale value differ between loblolly and longleaf pine? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I don't have data on that. Um, I, I can't answer that, but it, it would be something interesting to look at for sure. Another one here, the challenge of increasing slash diversifying restoration funding is shared by most, if not all conservation organizations. Is Texan by nature actively assisting other organizations with this need as well? Yeah, so Texan by nature's main goal is connecting the corporate world with the conservation world. And so I would encourage their, their conservation summit will happen again um, this November. If you get on their website, you can, you can already register for that. Um, great program, but their whole mission is to bring corporate interests together with 
um, with with conservation interests. I, they're just doing great work. Uh, again, I mean, proof is in the pudding. How many times has your conservation organization just been approached at a thing and uh, at a at an event like that and handed a check, basically? So um, it's just I think they serve as a a clearinghouse, if you will. These corporate interests see Texan by nature as a uh, a place where they can go and if, if they've highlighted a project, then they say, okay, well, it must be good. Texan by nature endorsed them. And so they're, they're really willing to, to help out. So, and, and they're just doing great work to nurture those, those corporate interests and, and steer them towards conservation projects. That's fantastic. There's a comment here from uh, my colleague in the program, Nate Fuller, who's a bat biologist. He says, bat people are ready to help out with any bat related needs as well. So mm. if there's, any, if there's anything, if there's anything that um, you can think of, you need the Batman involved. Give him oh, a call. I will call the Batman. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. Okay. Uh, what <laughs> does the burn do? Is it needed to minimize other plant competition or for the tree yeah. development? Ooh. Yeah, it's needed for the the long leaf is really susceptible to competition, um, and so it's it just it relies on that burn to 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 beat back that competition and um and and again it, it it creates that understory diversity as well but if there's any loblolly in the area and it blows in it'll overtake a longleaf stand very quickly um and so keeping that fire in there to knock back the the loblolly and the other woody competition is is just really important especially when they're young the trees are young Okay, another question. Here. How long does it take to regenerate the diverse understory of Forbes in relation to growing the actual longleaf pines when starting from a tract of land that was previously worked under a plantation style management? You know, it varies, uh, varies on soil type and, and other factors, but um, and, and how long it's been logged and compaction and all of that. But we find that in most cases, the, the seed bank is there. And so um most of our you know as soon as that um as, as soon as you can get enough uh uh fuel to to do a prescribed burn you know you're going to you're going to start seeing seeing the diversity increase we do work closely with the Texas Native Seeds program um and for any any landowners we're doing one of one of our projects this year um is a pasture conversion uh, it, it had been hay pasture. Obviously, that's going to be a much more challenging situation to get rid of a hay of grass, and so we're probably going to we're going to need to underseed that one, um, or, or seed it with native grasses um, and forbs. But in most cases, the seed bank is there, and when you get rid of the woody vegetation, open it up to sunlight, um, we see we see the the um, herbaceous stuff coming back pretty quick. Excellent. And there's one last uh, comment, as far as I can see. Um, oh, no, there's two. Uh, Longleaf pine trees sold through Native Plant Society of Texas and Texas Master Naturalist and Master Garden Organization. Plant sales would help to get the public behind your efforts and not just mm -hmm. the corporate and large tree farm owners. So maybe there's some considerations for broader yeah. public awareness with those groups. That's a That's a great point. It is a great point. Yeah. And another comment here. Uh, you have to be invited to present at the Texan by Nature Summit, and there is a uh, definite application process to become a conservation wrangler who are invited to okay. present. Yes. Yeah. But I think the summit is open to the public. <clears throat> okay. Um, Okay, I may have another question here. I may have missed it, but is this a case of indefinite management? Not judging, just wondering if there was a point at which the long leaf will mit maintain itself. Uh, you know, I think it's it's going to be reliant on fire. Um, you know, it 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 will maintain itself, but the ecosystem will not be in as good a shape uh, without fairly frequent fire. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a forest that requires management, just like any other. Um, any other native ecosystem. <clears throat>